<laughs> God. What a mad world we live in, huh? All right. I didn't get to what I want to get to. Oh, the guy who lived to 112. I promised you that. Hold it. Everyone wants to live longer except people who are depressed and don't want to live at all. That's Those are the ones who are going to vote for Hillary. Those who want, those who want uh, euthanasia will vote for Hillary. You break the election down. Those, those people who want euthanasia will vote for uh, Hillary. And those who oppose euthanasia will vote for Trump. I can give you other dividing lines. Israeli Holocaust survivor, 112, oldest man in the world. As you know, last week, a Japanese gentleman died at 112. Mr. N Mr. Yasutaro Koidi. Well, now the oldest man in the world is an Israeli Holocaust survivor, age 112. Now, the reason this story is important for you to listen to, even if you're not interested in Israel or, or the Holocaust, is to show you what a human can live through and still survive. It just shows you what the faith in God can do. Okay, so he has in his possession a marriage certificate from the 1920s. Crystal was born in 1903 in the town of Zanov in the Lutz province of what is now Poland to a religious Jewish family. His father was a Jewish scholar, and this man, Mr. Crystal, went to a religious primary school until the age of 11, like Obama did. Obama didn't go to a Jewish religious school, he went to a Muslim one, but I'm giving you an example, a religious school for, for boys. During the First World War, Mr. Crystal's father was forced into military service with the Russian army, survived the war, and returned home. The father comes home, marries, has two children, moves to the city of Lodz. He establishes a successful sweets and chocolate factory. Following the Nazi invasion of Poland and the occupation of Lodz, Mr. Crystal was moved into the Lodz ghetto with his family, but listen to this, was allowed to continue operating his chocolate factory, which, which is a shocker. His two children died in the ghetto, while Mr. Crystal and his wife were then sent to Auschwitz, following the liquidation of the Lodz ghetto by the Nazis in August of '44. Crystal's wife was murdered by the German bastards in the ghetto, while Crystal uh, and, and the wife died. But he survived by doing forced labor in the concentration camp and other camps as well. Listen to what the man went through so far, before you talk about a Jewish conspiracy. Or that he's a Zionist who survived through his, through his wits. He, he survived doing forced labor in the concentration camp. He survives the concentration camps after losing his children and his mother and his father and his wife to the Nazi bastards. And then after the war, he goes back to Lodz. He reestablishes his sweets factory and he marries again in 1947. Then in 1950, you talk about a will to survive. He, he moves to Israel with his wife and his infant boy, Chaim. He settles in Haifa, where he's lived ever since. The couple had a daughter, Shula. And then he built a new sweets factory in the city called Crystal Sweets. Here's the killer point. He remained religious throughout his entire life. He puts on what are known as phylacteries, the tefillin. He prays every day. He recites the prayers to God by heart because his eyesight is poor. His daughter says the Holocaust did not affect his beliefs. He believes he was saved because that's what God wanted. He is not an angry person. He is not someone who seeks to an accounting. He believes everything has a reason in the world. My father is someone who is always happy. He is optimistic, wise, and he values what he has. His attitude to life, this is the oldest man on earth, is this, everything in moderation. He eats and sleeps moderately and says that a person should always be in control of their own life and not have their life control them as far as this is possible. That's very, very interesting. It's interesting to me because he doesn't attribute his extreme longevity to anything other than God and believes that his old age is simply a divine form of divine grace that has been bestowed upon him. He says that if he had created some medicine that extended life, then it would be something notable. But his attitude is that he has just lived his life and reached this age, and that's his reality. It wasn't in his hands that's what he believes. Now, the moral of this story for my audience, I realize it's not Cruz, Trump, Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal. It's not. It's because it's an inspirational story. The next time you feel down, you can't go on, your life's too bad, you don't know how you can survive, it's so bad because I lost my job, or I lost, lost my girlfriend, or my dog died. You know, like, you know, get a grip. Get a grip. Here's a man who lost everything, lost his children to the Nazi bastards, Wife murdered by the Nazi bastards, put into forced labor camps by the Nazi bastards, and he comes out and survives and starts his life again. Now he's 112. 
So what in the world do you need to know that human beings are very durable? When I was a kid, I used to read the newspapers that were left around the house. I looked at the pictures in the Daily News. I didn't read the paper much. I looked at the pictures. I liked the pictures. And I, there was always a picture of a ghetto kid who fell out of a building and, like, bounced off an awning on the way to the curb from the third floor and lived. And they would, like, do dots from the third floor, dot, 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 dot. Johnny fell out of the window and hit an awning and bounced and hit the curb and lived to tell about it. He didn't have a scratch on on, I used to look at those pictures, and as a little kid, I would say to myself, I wonder if I fell out of a window, if I could, if I could survive. If I, and I would try to imagine bouncing off that, <laughs> that awning. I was that kind of kid. I was trying to like, put myself in the picture, you know, like, okay, if I fell out of a window, you aim for the awning, and you make sure you, your feet hit, and then you try to land on your feet when you bounce off the awning, not on your head, or else you wind up a Democrat. I'll be right back. How much do you think anything is worth? There's a photographer who takes portraits of Silicon Valley's most powerful buccaneers, and he charges $150,000 and up per picture. He sold a picture of, of a potato for over a million dollars. Kevin Abbosh has met every high-powered executive from Google chairman Eric Schmidt to Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg to Twitter's Jack Dorsey. And he lives between Ireland and Boston. He takes beautiful portraits of busy executives and celebrities in just a few seconds. And he takes one or two shots, and that's it. He gets $150,000, up to $500,000 if a commercial licensing comes into play. This week, he is at the Davos, uh, Switzerland World Economic Forum, because that's where all of the rich buccaneers are. He said, I can't afford not to be here. He's taking pictures of Malala, who that is. I don't know, Johnny Depp. Isn't that amazing? That's truly amazing. I don't understand why anyone pay $150,000 for a picture. But that's amazing, $150,000 for a picture. That's pretty big. And he, and, but the thing is, he did it all on his own. He said he, he got to the high number because he read an article about one of Hollywood's most famous photographers, Herb Ritz, who charged $10,000 a day. And he told CBS he wanted a similar rate of 5000 for the few-hour-long shot. At first, CBS laughed at him and told him they could hire Ritz for that amount. He said, do you want Herb Ritz or do you want me? CBS met him in the middle. Since that day, Abosh has had no trouble charging high prices for his time and work. And as more and more high-powered fools ask him to take their pictures, those prices keep getting met. Can you believe this? This year he sold a picture of a potato for 1 million euros. A picture of a potato for 1 million euros? Kevin Abosh, another breakthrough moment for him, came when he photographed Johnny Depp. As he was taking pictures, he glanced down at his camera, saw this shot, and says he got chills. Chills. And that's the story of this. Now, this is all about ego and, and, her, and the her, herb, herd mentality. I almost said the herb mentality. But I meant the herd mentality or, or the flock mentality. This becomes a bidding war amongst the rich to show who has money. It's like giving money to charities. They don't even know what they're giving it to. They want to just be seen giving a million, 10 million, 20 million, 50 million, 100 million to up the other guy. Watch the show Billions on Showtime and you'll see what creates trends and how trends are created. Is that picture really worth $150,000? No. In the next hour... Liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, Trump, Cruz, and all the news on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. It is a jungle out there, especially in the political jungle. We have been talking about what is a liberal, what is a conservative. 
And I said to you, the classical liberals were not so bad. They had an adage. They may not agree with you, but they would fight for your right to say it. Well, they've gone. There are no liberals left. They are now progressive, fanatic fascists. And I ask, how is it that liberal companies evade taxes and then call for higher taxes? And then we talked about the Chobani yogurt owner bringing in Middle Eastern refugees to work who is lobbying around the clock with major corporations to bring in more refugees from the Middle East. We then talked about Clinton emails are so secret some lawmakers can't, can't read them. We then showed you that Jane Fonda is now running a smear campaign against Donald Trump. Friends of a feather, watch out for that one. I then told you that the general election is like a high school popularity contest. I then told you that Drudge is running a poll. Go vote on it. And then we talked about the world's oldest man, 112. And I showed you the privations he had been through, the disasters, living through the Holocaust. Wife killed, children killed, parents killed, forced labor camps, slave labor. Comes out, 1947, starts a factory again, and he's now 112. I mean, you can overcome anything if you don't quit and you don't give in. I, mean, I think it's faith in God is why he's still going. It begs the question of God chose him to live, why did he kill so many? I can't even answer that question. Faith is dumb. you got to understand that. See, you cannot apply logic to faith. The minute you do, you can't have faith. Faith and logic don't are not compatible. They don't work. This is the problem between highly educated people who lose their faith and people who are God-fearing who, I'm, I'm afraid, sometimes don't think that clearly. Now, there are exceptions, and you'll get mad at me and say that you're highly educated and logical and you believe in God, and that's that's okay. But in my experience in life, you have to have a kind of belief. Belief is an interesting word. Belief and faith are two interesting words, and the origin, the root origin of the word belief is very interesting. Faith is very interesting what that derives from, but it's not based upon reason. Because if God chose this one man to survive these privations while he killed so many innocent others, then what does that say about God? And so you start going there, you can't believe in anything, right? And then you wind up as Harvey Weinstein, I would imagine. Eyeless in Gaza and faithless in L.A. KCMO, Julie, welcome to the program. What's your topic? We're all over the map today. My grandfather, he's 105, and he lives with me. He, uh, in 1926, all he, he was 16. He would work all day, and he uh, attributes his long life to faith. Uh, going to church, believing in God, uh, love of family, and working hard all his whole life. He still works. He every time he he, he, he still works. At, he works at 105, Julie. Well, when I'm doing something in the house, he asks me what he can do to help me. Oh, 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 he doesn't just sit around on his behind and watch Oprah. No, he gets up and helps me if I'm doing the dishes or cooking. He helps. so he tries to keep keep active even in the limited confines of a home. Now you said he listens to talk radio, did you? He and I were listening to you uh, on KCMO making cookies. <laughs> oh, that's the heartland, you know. KCMO would be the heartland, Kansas City, right in the heart of America. He was a farmer and. Uh, he was a boxer? Your 105-year-old grandpa was a boxer? A farmer. Wait, I, I'm not hearing you. I'm having trouble today with callers and hearing you. Did you say he was a boxer or what? A farmer. Uh, thank you. Either my head's going or my equi equipment stinks. A farmer, that's the hardest work on the planet, being a farmer. He would cook, uh, pick 100 bushels of corn a day, and then he'd go to uh, dance and go dancing, and uh, it cost about a dollar, and he only made about two dollars. He. I would. I would love to. I would love to hear what your grandfather thinks about America today. I take it he's not a big fan of Barack Obama's presidency. No, he wants. Uh, he doesn't like Hillary either. Who does he? Who does he want to win? Well, he told me. Um, you know, he watches TV, but he just. He told me that I, I, I could tell him who to vote for, and he would vote for them. Oh, so he doesn't really know right now. Doesn't. What does he think? What does he think of Donald Trump, and what does he think of Ted Cruz? What do you think of Donald Trump, Grandpa? I. Uh, <laughs> what? I think Donald Trump is a good man. 
He said he's a good